The weekly cybercrime and business podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact to their business, and proactively address threats head on. Hey everybody, today is April 24th, 2015. I am Jeff Peters, the Hack Surfer Editor. I'm here with Matt Leifus, Hack Surfer Writer, and Michael Fell, Surfwatch Labs Data Analyst. Coming up after the news and discussion, we have an interview with Kevin Epstein. He's the Vice President of Advanced Security and Governance for Proofpoint. Um, and they just released their Human Factor Report 2015, which is about all the different trends in phishing um, that have changed since their last report in 2014. So it's a pretty interesting conversation. But yeah, before we get into that stuff, uh, throw it over to you, Matt, for the top headlines from the week. Coming at number three this week, we had an Israeli company called Fab Molds. Uh, Fab Molds is the owner of the Israeli arm importer Fab Defense. They got a website you can go to. Check that out. Um, they were part of the Op Israel attacks this year, the annual attack that Anonymous pulls off and brags about and talks about. They were able to leak uh, some login personal information on several of uh, local and international clients, and some of those clients were government officials. Coming in number two this week, and I thought this was actually a pretty interesting story. Uh, it was Pinnacle Law Firm. This is an Arkansas-based law firm. They're representing three police officers that, with, that are accusing their police department of kind of being corrupt. And the law firm is actually now kind of adding fuel to the fire. They're claiming that the same police department attempted to spy in some of the behind the scenes in the, in the lawsuit to kind of understand, you know, what kind of information they had on the officers and things like that. Um, an attorney for the law firm, Matt Campbell, sent a hard drive to this police department to get like emails and any uh, information relevant to the case. When that police department sent back the hard drive, Campbell found that it was infected with three well-known Trojans, including a backdoor and, as they said, a password-sniffing keylogger. So I thought that was kind of an interesting story. Way to go, law enforcement. And number one this week, we have HSBC. This was a breach that affected mortgage customers. HSBC discovered a breach of their network on March 27th. The breach lasted from late 2014 and ended in early 2015. The breach affected 10 finance subsidiaries in four states for HSBC. It's an unknown number of mortgage customers that were affected, but some researchers have actually gone on record saying that the figure could be substantial. And that's the top news this week. Yeah, so I thought it would be interesting since RSA is this week and everyone's sort of been talking about RSA and chatting about RSA and a lot of companies are there, uh, including Surfwatch Labs. I thought it'd be interesting to just kind of run down some of the highlights of, of what happened at RSA this week. One thing everyone's been talking about is this uh, keynote address by RSA President Amit Yaran. In his keynote address, he said that the security industry is failing, said it has failed, um, he also said that, you know, we're losing the contest and the adversaries are outmaneuvering the industry. So a lot of people have been sort of picking up on that. And I guess if you look at the numbers, it's kind of true. Last year, according to the Identity Theft Resource Center, there were 738 data breaches, and that was up 25% from the previous year. Bruce Schneider, a uh, computer researcher, is pretty famous. Um, he was there on Tuesday um, addressing a large crowd, and... According to the examiner, they said that he offered a supremely dark view of the computerized future, uh, one which our failure to properly secure technology may lead to what he termed the age of catastrophic risk. On one hand, you got the, the RSA president saying that, you know, we're failing, and then you have a lot of these other uh, presentations and addresses where people are saying um, things are going to get worse and they don't really know or have answers and things like that. Something I also found interesting was Richard A. Clark, the former advisor on cybersecurity to the president, and the same gentleman who was testifying in front of the 9-11 Commission, in one of his talks at RSA, warned um, the conference of cybersecurity increasingly targeting intellectual property. 
And I think that's one of the big risks that people always kind of forget is we we always get stuck in the weeds and talking about this piece of malware and this part, this and that, but we don't really focus on the effects of what. So what what are people going after? Granted, a lot of cyber criminals go after credit card numbers and personally identifiable information, but a lot of them also go after intellectual property that could have long term effects on corporations and small businesses and other organizations. Everyone's been talking about. Uh... This mobile malware threat's been getting reported on quite a bit the last year, so I thought some of the research that came out from uh, from Google and Dambala at RSA was pretty interesting. Dambala, they said that, you know, the, sort of the big headline from their research that they conducted, um, they looked at 50% of U.S. mobile traffic, and they found that you're 1.3 times more likely to get struck by lightning than have mobile malware communicating on your device. So that's sort of the big headline that's been getting reported on. And, and they sort of compared the mobile threat to Ebola in the United States. You know, yes, it's harmful, but it's it's greatly over-exaggerated and it's contained to a really limited percentage of the population that are engaging in behavior that puts them at risk. This really surprises me considering, you know, everyone has a cell phone now. They're with us 24-7. They, they connect to other things and... You know, in my time, my brief stint here with Surfwatch Labs, I, I've heard a lot of people talk, you know, in fear about what could happen with your mobile device. So when, when you know, when we were going through this, uh, that this stat really surprised me. But then again, when you're looking back through our data and everything, you don't, you don't see a lot of. The, the threat is there, but, it, you know, I, I guess it's right. You don't actually see a lot of, you know, mobile device leading to this or whatever else. But the, it still, to me, is pretty shocking. Uh, I, I, I can't believe that you're 1.3 times more likely to be struck by lightning than have mobile, mal you know, malware communicating on your device. I think that's, I think that's really surprising. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of headlines, you know, at least I have, where it says, you know, 99% of Android devices are vulnerable or 80% of Android devices are vulnerable. And uh, Google's lead Android engineer, Adrian Ludwig, uh, he was presenting at RSA, and he kind of highlighted some of these stats from Blue Box about two of the exploits against Android. And he said, you know, like, for example, one of them, you know, even though 99% of Android users were at risk at the time of disclosure, it was only leveraged less than eight times per one million devices. And another one that had 82% of Android users at risk was once per one million. So, I mean, even though a lot of people might be vulnerable or at risk, and you see these big headlines, it seems to me, at least according to this data that, um, and Dan Bella's data, that it's really not as much of a threat as people are making it out to be. So that's what I thought was really the most interesting thing uh, from all these RSA articles that I've read. Anybody else have anything that stood out to them from uh, the RSA coverage this week? Yeah, there was one that actually, uh, it was another one that really stood out to me because when I first, again, with my short stint here, we talked, you know, last year there was a lot of POS breaches, point of sale breaches. And two gentlemen, uh, self-described fraud fighters, uh, David Byrne and Charles Henderson, they spoke at RSA. And they spoke at length about an unnamed company that they you know they said it's one of the world's largest point of sale vendors has been using the same password since 1990 so 25 years one of the world's largest point of sale vendors has been using the same password on top of that 90% of the, this this unknown company unnamed company's uh customer base 90% of them are doing the same exact thing so that could be a pretty catastrophic uh, data breach if that password were ever be exploited. We're going back to the very beginning how they said at RSA that cybersecurity has failed. Well, I think right there, you know, that's one of the big reasons. Right, You know, that's just, you can't do that in today's society. I, I, I was very shocked by that as well. And the other movement that kind of came out that, again, this is actually to me kind of funny, the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security have plans in place that they announced to RSA to have set up a satellite office in Silicon Valley. Secretary Johnson of the 
Department of Homeland Security actually went on record and was quoted saying, I hope some of you listening will consider a tour of service for your country. He was speaking to some of the cybersecurity experts and up and coming people. I, I kind of think this is funny. We'll see how that goes and how that all works out. But yeah, I'm I'm a little more cynical regarding this new policy, just given the levels of bureaucratic nightmares that cybersecurity folks have to deal with in um, the government. I mean, there's statistics and reports coming out that the government's having problems recruiting cyber professionals because of the bureaucracy and the um, antiquated hiring process and how wages aren't keeping up with the private sector. So, I mean, good for them for trying this, but I doubt, again, and being a cynic, I doubt that this is going to actually work and they're going to come back with their tail between their legs. Well, it's kind of hard for, you know, Silicon Valley kind of views from experts I've talked to. They just kind of look at government and say, you guys don't have a clue what you're talking about. And government kind of wants them to conform and be like, well, you need to understand our process and what we have to do. And it's it's just a mess. It's it's very – it's. I've read reports and stories of how the commu cybersecurity community or the technology community in general has kind of gone into two different camps. You'll have the West Coast Silicon Valley folks who kind of look at the government and what they're saying about encryption and the NSA and other issues and kind of look at them with suspicion. And then you have the new industry kind of developing in and around Fort Meade and the Washington, D.C. area. Um, which, in full disclosure, I at, we currently live in this area. So it's kind of an interesting division in the com in the tech community right now. Yeah, so moving on, we have our cyber tip of the week. I guess one, one interesting thing about all this RSA coverage is a lot of people, at least from the articles I've been reading, have been talking about how, you know, it's sort of a little bit doom and gloom. Um, people just saying there's not much that, that they can do or they don't have the answers and things are getting worse. But as you, as we just discussed, like with the point of sale vendor using the same password, there is still a lot of simple things that can be done. So the tip this week is you know, I'm kind of beating a dead horse. I, you know, if you listen to the podcast, I'm sure we've mentioned this many times. But um, at RSA, they were talking about how um, a lot of people have been moving all their information to the cloud as a way to improve security and reduce the risk of data theft. But they said at a at, at an RSA panel session. Several security experts pointed out that authentication controls for both consumers and enterprises storing their data in the cloud is usually just a one-step process, and they don't even have two-factor authentication on that data. So, you know, despite all this talk about how there's all these problems, there's still a lot of simple things like having two-factor authentication on your important data that's in the cloud that you should be doing, obviously, as a business. Uh, yeah, that's it for this week's discussion. Moving on, we have the interview with uh, Proof Points Kevin Epstein, where we talk about uh, their Human Factor 2015 Fishing Trends Report. Last time we spoke was in 2014, and I remember uh, when we chatted then, um, the phrase that stuck out in my mind was you said that, you know, everybody clicks. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I think one of the uh, stats was that 95% of targeted cyber attacks start with phishing. That's what you told me uh, mm -hmm. a year ago. But now, you know, I know it's 2015, you guys put out a new report on phishing, so I'm just wondering what's different in the world of phishing today versus, you know, say a year ago. This was definitely the year that cyber criminals went corporate. We talk about this in the report, but everything about the attack methodology shifted. Unfortunately, they uh, are good marketers, so they watched their feedback from last year. And as people learned to look out for things like social networking invites and fake order confirmations and things like that, uh, attackers shifted. So what did they shift? Um, delivery times shifted. So instead of early morning before you had your coffee, uh, the highest delivery point is now Tuesday between about 7 and 10 in the morning Pacific time. And then they shifted days of the week. Again, it used to be loaded towards the end of the week when you're kind of low resistance. Now it's much more Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, sort of high points during the business week. Um, the lures themselves are no longer you know, fake ticket confirmation. Now it's much more about 
have you received the attached voicemail? Have you received the attached e-fax? Which, if you're a business manager, well, you, you want to click on these things. Mm -hmm. And the level in the corporation is also being uh, changed. The attackers last uh, year were much more after sort of rank-and-file staff, and this year it's solidly middle management focused. I'm curious if there's anything that sort of surprised you about those findings. I mean, was there anything that maybe you were expecting to see and then didn't see or, or vice versa? Uh, I'll go with the vice versa. We were looking for highly sophisticated modern zero-day attacks, and there were lots of those, but there were also a very large number of you know, Back to the Future style MS Office macro attacks. That which is old is new again. <laughs> the The number of interesting... Uh, exploits triggered by a macro. So the exploit itself might be a pretty significant and, and, uh, and deep um, exploit. But the initiation that got that onto your system would be standard office macro, something buried in a, a Word doc. One thing that surprised me reading it was uh, said the last 12 months saw a 94% decrease in the use of social media invitation and order confirmation lures. Which you kind of touched on a little bit, but I guess you know that's kind of one of the main things I think about when I think of phishing. So I guess I'm I'm a little behind the times, I guess. Well, it it just means that you know average everyday folks like you and me are are not the primary targets anymore. Right? It, it it was it, we've again we've seen a huge shift from uh, folks sweeping a wide net. If you were a cyber criminal uh, two years ago, you did a mass customized campaign. Uh, folks like you or me would get what looked like a social invite or, a, or an order confirmation. We'd click on it. Trojan would be on our computer, and it would attempt to tap individual bank information. And what cyber criminals realized is, you know, that they, they'd get a pretty good haul in their net, but a lot of that's bait fish. Um, my information is not particularly valuable. <laughs> and instead, uh, what's shifted, again, the, the volume's gone down, but now it's more like tuna fishing. Right. They're, they're going after um, wire transfer and, and real large financial asset type uh, attacks. And to do that, you don't need to get as many people clicking. You just need to get more of the right people clicking. So the good news is if, if you're not seeing uh, uh, e-fax and, uh, and a voicemail attachment attacks uh, or newsletter attacks, uh, you're probably not a target. I think overall the number was one in every 25 message uh, was clicked by users. Um, I mean, is that pretty consistent with what you guys expected, or is that good, bad? Um, it's unfortunately consistent, but bad. <laughs> so, I mean, think about that number, 1 in 25. Well, I don't know how many malicious messages you get. Uh, I get a lot of messages. I don't know how many of those are malicious. But if I was to click on a link in one out of every 25 messages I got, I'd be clicking quite a few links per day. And if you think about an organization, even a small organization, let's say it's a 50-person organization, and assume that, oh, one fish gets through per day. So now you're looking at one fish, 50 people, and a click rate of 1 in 25. Well, you know, within a week or so, someone's getting infected. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to talk about that because it seems, you know, I've asked people this on our podcast previously, but it seems, you know, phishing is always a problem. You know, like I said, we spoke a year ago, it was a problem. Um, so it just seems kind of like the one constant that's never really going away. And, you know, I guess you could argue whether we're getting better at it or protecting against it. So I guess just your thoughts overall on, on what can be done to sort of combat the problem or if it's just something that's sort of going to always be there and you got to work on other avenues. It's a great question. And, you know, training has been raised. Can we train people not to do this? Um, training definitely has an impact on click rate. Uh, better trained people click less, but attackers keep changing their tactics. So uh, even with retraining, we found that training alone is not sufficient. And there has to be some form of mechanized or automated targeted attack protection. Uh, and bluntly, more importantly these days, automated threat response, given the speed of exfiltration on these things. It's one of those situations where you know, phishing is clearly here to stay. Right? We're, we're on the cusp of, uh, of RSA every year. Uh, if you walk the, the show floors at any of the major security conferences, every demonstration begins with the phrase, so if phish comes into the organization and we need better protection against the initial phish, 
But we also need better protection once it's clicked, because if you if you accept the statistical inevitability that someone clicks, again, that hasn't changed. Everybody clicks. So if you accept that statistical inevitability, you can you can reduce it significantly. But if it's still going to happen, then it's a question of how well prepared are you to figure out from the many fire alarms going off in your organization, from the 30,000 alerts that are coming into your SIM system, which are the ones that signify real fires and which are false alarms and which are lower priority, which are the ones that say, well, the marketing person downloaded an adware toolbar. Okay, we can wait on that. And which are the ones that say the CEO just downloaded the keylogger and it's actively exfiltrating every, every keystroke, right? That, that would be a higher priority. And that's not something we could ask any, any reasonable security team to do manually. So clearly there's a need beyond training for automated threat response. Yeah, I'm, I'm also curious, like you said, middle management's being targeted more. And I think it said in your guys' uh, report that the click rates doubled also uh, in middle management. But if you look at like executives, I think um, from my recollection that their rates were much lower than, you know, uh, regular staff or middle management. So just wondering if you could maybe explain that to me. Is it that the executives are more aware of these threats and more cautious than maybe the, the rest of the organization? Um, I think it's a combination of, of caution and um, protection systems. So traditionally in the organization, uh, you know, we, we had a, a fortress mentality, right? So we had the big firewalls. It's our big you know, castle with the, with a wall around it. And then you, you protect the king. <laughs> and so uh, within security organizations, you know, special attention was paid to the systems to which uh, chief officers had access. Right? Their, their email might receive extra screening. Their laptops get checked more often, et cetera. And, of course, they, they by nature, hopefully are more cautious in, in what they click. Additionally, the types of email they receive, yes, they probably receive a similar volume, but many times they have administrators in front of them sorting through mail. And so it's rare that they would get a fish that would come all the way through and be compelling for them to click um, versus, again, uh, rank and file and middle management, fewer screeners, perhaps less security, and a higher degree of just information overload. If you're a middle manager going through 100 email messages in your mailbox early on a Tuesday morning, you're just click, 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 get it out there, there, delete, respond, answer. What's this? A fax? Click the fax. Okay, that's a junk fax. Throw it away. Five minutes later, you won't even remember having clicked on that attachment. But someone will notice. <laughs> yeah, and I guess uh, in terms of uh, what is successfully working, you, you talked a bit about attachments. Is that you know the main thing that you guys saw is just uh, an increase in people sort of you guys targeting that management with those types of attachments? It, it's, yeah, it's interesting. We, we saw a difference, uh, again, two years ago was, was long lining. It was mass customization of things like order confirmations or ticket confirmations. And the attackers have gone upscale and downscale. Um, I'd call downscale attachments because attachments um, may contain very sophisticated zero-day malware, but by their very nature, because that malware can't be changed. It's fixed in whatever it is in the attachment. That attachment has a limited lifespan. You know, usually within about three days, signature-based programs will catch up with most of the attachments. Sometimes it takes a week or, or maybe more. Um, but at the same time, we also see a lot more use of, uh, how to put it, inadvertent fish, parasitic fish, if you will, where a legitimate site, uh, an industry analyst site, for example, gets compromised by the attackers, and then the standard industry newsletter that's been whitelisted comes in, people read through it, oh, it looks interesting, I'll click and go check that out on the industry site, and the industry site takes them down, a classic water hole attack, but it's sort of an email augmented watering hole attack. They wouldn't think to click to that site except the newsletter comes in. So there's, again, we've gone to a more attachments and then more subtle watering hole augmented phishing attacks versus uh, the previous year where, where the body was mass customized direct email attacks. Yeah, I guess then sort of my final question would be just, you know, looking forward. I mean, is there any fun call predictions or anything that you kind of see continuing um, sort of in terms of phishing that people should be aware of? Um, so I'd, I'd make two I'll call them predictions for the next year, or a prediction and a, and a, and a warning. 
uh, the, the prediction is attackers having gone corporate are seeing results from it, and there's no reason for them to back off. Uh, especially notable in our in our report, as, as much as people make fun of sales and marketing clicking on malicious links, um, supply chain and order procurement were some of the highest targeted and highest clicking areas. And if you think about the types of mayhem and, uh, and financial losses that can be associated with a successful breach of an order procurement system, you can easily see seven to ten figure numbers in that. So I, you know, first prediction is. They're not done with attackers aren't done with being corporate. We're we're going to see large number of losses from this type of corporate attacks, both direct financial transfer uh, and just uh, um, you know, secondary losses along that line. Mm -hmm. But the other prediction, and I hate to say this, this is this is this is like I feel like I'm wearing those one of those sandwich board signs that says the world's going to end. Um, but everyone clicks right? In, until we're no longer a current type of human being. Um, we're all curious. We're all under work pressure and stress. We all make occasional errors, and everybody clicks. So I see no end in sight to the to the attack trend that uses phishing as the primary mechanism uh, into companies. It's a dominant threat vector uh, today. It's a dominant threat vector last year. It was a dominant threat vector the year before that, and it will continue to be a dominant threat vector arguably accompanied by social media, which is certainly a rising threat vector, same tactics in, in uh, uh, social media. But I certainly believe this will happen next year as well. And that being said, you know, you talk about how it's going to keep continuing happening. You know, everyone I seem to talk to always talks about how training is still, I guess, sort of the best bang for the buck in terms of fishing. Um, just wondering if you still agree with that, given how we're talking about, you know, everything kind of keeping shifting and kind of staying ahead of the employees. Yeah, you know, I have, I have, again, I have mixed feelings about training. On the one side, um, it certainly uh, reduces the number of clicks and reduces the number of infe infections. It's undeniable. Training has a positive effect, uh, certainly a, a weapon in the arsenal of, of a defender. Um, that said, is it the best bang for the buck? I guess that depends on how much your training costs. <laughs> um, the challenge at the end of the day is that no matter how good the training, it will never reduce the uh, the volume to zero. And all it takes is one of the wrong clicks. So personally, I, if I already ha was doing some form of training in my organization, and again, most security teams, you already have a firewall in place. Well, for gosh sakes, keep that. Uh, you already have training in place. You already have basic security measures. Um, I would invest in the first, in the missing piece, the missing layers, and then go back and re-examine whether upgrades to other layers were necessary. So missing layers tend to be targeted attack protection and most significantly uh, threat response systems. Again, I, I think a number of the headline breaches in this past year mention the aspect of, oh, some system alerted on this, but our security team didn't get it in time. And the only way around that is arming your security team with some additional automatic weapons, as it were, <laughs> so automated threat response for a uh, for security team. Yeah, well, that's um, all the questions I have then, unless there's anything else you wanted to touch on before we leave. No, again, I, I you know, it's it's easy to be a doomsayer, and I want to be clear, that's not the, the space that we're coming from. Um, crime is a part of the physical world. It will be a part of the Internet. Most people knock on wood, that you know will not suffer uh, a criminal event during their lifetime. And ideally, that would be the same uh, situation online. Uh, the secret, however, is that in everyday life, we're all taught as we grow up to avoid certain areas at night and lock your doors and take basic security precautions. On the internet, I, I think that uh, we're all in a, in a high crime area and still lacking in many cases what could be considered um, significant or at least uh, uh, important security measures, again, like, like attack protection and, uh, and security response systems. Um, we, we think of email as this harmless little innocuous uh, system, uh, and it is a crucial threat vector. Uh, it's time we, we start locking our doors on that front. Yeah, well, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. A pleasure, and uh, have a great day, man.
That's it for this week's Cybercrime and Business Podcast. As always, you can follow us on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you listen. And for more information, check out surfwatchlabs.com.